respected chancellor of this university the pro chancellor the vice chancellor my good friend former chief justice of india honorable mr justice ranjan gogoi distinguished faculty of this university my dear students let me begin by saying a very good morning to all of you not in english but in assamese super both i think i am right the topic that we have chosen for discussion today namely education for empowerment or emancipation has actually coincided with a festival that we celebrated yesterday yesterday's festival was very important for youngsters like you can you tell me why why yesterday was very important for all of you saraswati puja oh i thought you will tell me something else <laughs> i thought all of you will say valentines day but i knew in the presence of your teachers you would not tell the truth <laughs> let me begin with a story josiah franklin was a blacksmith and a farmer he lived in england he migrated to boston with his wife and five children after begetting two more children his wife died after the death of his wife josiah franklin married another lady and begot 10 more children taking the to total tally to 17 children so he had much more than a cricket team at home the last of these 17 children dropped out of school at the age of 10 and started assisting his father as a soap and candle maker at the age of 12 this boy joined his elder brother as an apprentice in a printing press he was denied permission to publish some letters in his own publication so he wrote something in a pseudonym when caught this 17th child of josiah franklin ran away to philadelphia as a fugitive there he became a printer and publisher and founded what came to be known as academy and college of philadelphia which later became a university joining hands with two eminent persons he created a new model plan of american college which also became a university later in 1753 this school dropout was awarded honorary masters of master of arts degree by both harvard and yale in 1756 he received an honorary master of arts degree from the college of william and mary in june 1776 he was appointed a member of the committee of five that drafted the declaration of independence of the united states of america this school dropout boy was none other than benjamin franklin one of the founding fathers of the united states of america he was not just an academician but a prodigious inventor among his many inventions were the lightning rod the franklin stove bifocal glasses and the flexible urinary catheter he never patented his inventions 
In his autobiography, Benjamin Franklin said, as we enjoy great advantages from the inventors of other, inventions of others, we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by an invention of our own. And this we should do freely and generously. That's what Benjamin Franklin said. This is one story. Do you know who was the most successful dropout of Harvard University? A person who was for a fairly long time the wealthiest man in the world and the most successful entrepreneur and who owns Microsoft, namely Bill Gates, was the dropout of Harvard University. What did Bill Gates do to succeed in life after dropping out of a prestigious university? Another adolescent dropped out of college at 17, traveled to India to explore spirituality at the age of 17, returned home at the age of 19, co-founded a company at the age of 21, became the most successful manufacturer of computers, and introduced several innovations such as, now you will know if I tell you, iMac, iPhone, App Store, iPad, Steve Jobs was the dropout. What made this college dropout, Steve Jobs, different from rank holders in the college? The list of school and college dropouts who succeeded in life is endless. Michael Dell of CEO of Dell Technologies, Mark Zuckerberg, CEO of Facebook, Larry Ellison, co-founder of Oracle, Walt Disney, Henry Ford, Jan Combe, co-founder of WhatsApp, and so many others. Dear students, I have a question to ask you all. Are these successful people educated or uneducated? Under what category you will classify these people? Your chancellor, pro-chancellor and vice-chancellor should not mistake me as encouraging all of you to become dropouts. <laughs> I don't suggest that you drop out of college today to become successful in life. But I want you to think, what made these dropouts successful in life and would you categorize them as people who are educated or people who are uneducated? This is a question which I want to pose before all of you for you to ponder long after I have left. Take another example, Abraham Lincoln, the most celebrated American president who signed the Emancipation Declaration in 1863 making the Confederate States slavery free, free of slavery, and who is now known as the Great Emancipator. He was born on February 12, 1809. He lost his mother at the age of nine. He went to school just for one year, then studied on his own, worked as a postmaster, shopkeeper, etc. He taught himself law, wrote the bar exam, and he entered politics. Look at what happened to him from 19, 1832 onwards. In 1832, he lost his job. He contested an election and lost. In 1833, he failed in business. In 1835, he lost his sweetheart, not on February 14th. In 1836, he had a nervous breakdown, contested for the post of speaker unsuccessfully in 1838, defeated for a nomination for Congress in 1843, defeated for U.S. Senate in 1854, defeated for a nomination for Vice President in 1856, again defeated for U.S. Senate in 1858, 
but got elected with a huge majority in 1860 to become the president of the United States of America. What this, what made Abraham Lincoln keep on fighting against all odds? What made him overcome repeated failures both in his professional life and in his personal life? Is there an educational institution which taught him the secret of success or the method of changing misfortunes into fortunes? If there was one such educational institution, would not all of you like to join that institution? To find an answer to these questions, it is first necessary to know what education is. Unless we know what education is, we will not be able to find an answer to all these questions which I raised just now. The word education is derived from the Latin word educare or educere, meaning to bring up or bring forth. Dictionaries define the word to mean the act or process of acquiring knowledge. In Sanskrit, the word vidya signifies correct knowledge. Its root is vid, meaning to know, to understand. The word veda itself is derived from the root, root word ved, which means knowledge. But unfortunately, what is taught today in educational institutions is just the method of accumulation of information and not acquisition of knowledge. Swami Vivekananda said, if education is identical with information, then libraries are the greatest sages in the world and the encyclopedias will be the rishis. Education is not just accumulation of facts, but the training of the mind to think independently. The aim of education is to teach us how to think and not what to think. I will tell you a story to illustrate on how important the ability to think is for life. Once upon a time, an American and a Japanese were trekking in a forest. Suddenly, they spotted a tiger. The moment they spotted a tiger, both of them became nervous. But the Japanese immediately took his sports shoe out of his bag and changed his leather boot, changed from leather boots to sports shoe. The American laughed at him and said, my dear friend, do you think that by putting on sports shoe, you will be able to run faster than the tiger? The Japanese replied, no, my friend, it is not my intention to run faster than the tiger. It is my intention to run faster than you. Because once I run faster than you, the tiger will catch hold of the first man and it will be you and not me. It is this ability to think on your feet which actually is the basis of education. Education should prepare students to think, to think out of the box. It must make them doers and inventors and not just parrots who can repeat what is taught to them in classes. The problem that we have today of our system of education is the neglect of development of skills. Today, our engineering colleges produce a lot of automobile engineering graduates who cannot fix a stepney. Our engineering colleges produce a lot of electrical engineers who cannot fix a fused bulb. Our medical colleges produce a lot of doctors 
who cannot do any diagnosis without an instrument or an equipment our agricultural colleges produce graduates in agriculture who do not understand the scientific significance of mock bihu or the burning of meiji correct once upon a time the students of agriculture in the university of wisconsin went to an agricultural farm to have practical knowledge of how cultivation was being done they were all educated they were studying in a very reputed university they were studying bsc agriculture they met a 70 year old rustic farmer they developed a conversation one of the students in a very disrespectful tone asked the farmer about his educational background the farmer coolly replied my educational background it is this 5 years in a school and 65 years in a farm this is my background he said the farmer's knowledge of the nature of the soil type of crops effect of personal changes in cultivation the mineral content of water etc was much more than that of a professor of an agricultural university how did he gain such a knowledge without ever going to a college or university in fact when sir c p ramasamy year the most celebrated uh, the doyen of the bar when he traveled to england when he was lecturing in a college some of the students asked him sir you are from india we believe that you don't send your girls to school in india therefore we believe that all your women folk are uneducated cp ramasamy year gave a fantastic reply he said yes our women folk in the sense in which you understand what education is are actually unlettered but my mother's knowledge of the vedas the shastras the puranas the nature the ailments the body the psyche and the soul cannot be equaled by hundreds of professors of harvard that is the kind of education that our women folk have without ever going to school this is the reply that cp ramasamy here gave mark twain articulated the reason as to what lags what 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 is lagging behind in our educational system very pithily mark twain said college is a place where a teachers lecture notebooks go straight to the students lecture notes without ever passing through the brains of each other our education is today designed to test our memory not our creativity it stimulates our ability to read but not our ability to understand it teaches us what others have said but does not tell us ask us what we have to say it wants us to travel safely on the beaten track but not to lay a new path so how should the educational system be the answer is that education should emphasize the holistic development of an individual body mind and spirit when asked about what kind of education that we need in a country like india swami vekananda said i want that education by which character is formed strength of mind is increased and the intellect is expanded and by which one can stand on one's own legs so said swami vekananda but today we have a generation of youngsters who talk frequently about stress anxiety depression substance use suicide in our generation if ever we used the term stress or anxiety our father or mother will give a big slap 
and this anxiety will go away. <laughs> Unfortunately, today as parents, we have failed to do what our parents did to us. We don't give you a good slap, nor do we allow the teachers to give you a good slap. Why do you have anxiety? Why should you have stress? India Today carried a report on October 7, 2008 from Washington, which contained a very sad story. The story was an Indian-American millionaire who turned pauper overnight in the great American meltdown depression in 2008. This man, who was an IIT graduate, he killed his wife, he killed his mother-in-law, and three sons, one of whom was going to college, before taking his own life in one of the first tragedies of this financial crisis. As I told you, he was an IITian. He held a master's degree in business administration from one of the premier universities, namely University of California. What made these people so weak, despite having a lot of degrees from very reputed institutions? This question takes us to the next part of our discussion, namely empowerment. Cambridge University Dictionary defines empowerment to mean the process of freedom or power to do what you want or to control what happens to you. This is why you talk of female empowerment, youth empowerment, political empowerment, economic empowerment, workers' empowerment, and so on and so forth. If this is what empowerment is, then the next question is, is your education designed today to enable you to set goals, and does it enable you to achieve your goals without which empowerment is not possible? Unfortunately, Today, the goals that we set for our youngsters are set by elders and not by children themselves. At home, people decide what your goal should be. Your parents decide what you should become in life. Your parents want you to become an engineer. Your parents want you to become a doctor. Your parents want you to become a lawyer, therefore you are put into school. Your goals are set by somebody else, whether you like it or not, and you are forced to pursue them. Therefore, the system of education we have today is actually designed only to produce people who will fit into some jobs, preferably in government, or at least in leading industries in the private sector. As a result, our colleges and educational institutions do not focus on developing skills. Actually, the potential in each child is completely different from the potential in other childs. We do not have that education today which will tap the potential of each individual separately. A fish is an ace swimmer. A cheetah is an ace runner. An eagle is a great flyer, and a monkey is a great jumper from tree to tree. But we have a system of education that is uniform to all. We apply the same test to fishes, monkeys, donkeys, and everybody alike. Albert Einstein said, if you judge all these creatures by their ability to climb a tree, the fish will certainly fail. Each individual is endowed with different talents, wish lists, attitudes, and when it, education attempts to standardize everything on a common ground, most people end up being unhappily successful or happily wayward, both of which are to be avoided, is the purpose of education. Ramakrishna Paramahamsa illustrates this with a beautiful parable. Once, two, two great scholars took a boat on the river Hooghly to go, go from one place to another. On the way, 
these two scholars picked up a conversation with the boatman. One of these scholars asked this boatman, have you read the Ramayana? The boatman said, no sir. Then the scholar said, with a, with a disgraceful look, he said, oh, you have wasted 25 years of your life. Then the other scholar asked the boatman, have you read the Mahabharata? He said, no. Then that scholar said, oh, you have wasted another 25 years of your life. When they were riding, suddenly water, the river started swelling and the boat got caught in a whirlpool. When the boat was about to capsize, when water started entering the boat, the boatmen asked the scholars, Sir, do you know swimming? They said, No, no, we don't know. Then he said, You have wasted the whole life by not knowing swimming, but knowing something else. So of what use all this bookish knowledge when practical application is not taught to you in schools? Academic excellence and bookish knowledge do not empower individuals. Empowerment comes from determination and git, grit. So education should ignite what people call the fire in the belly. Life is never easy for everyone. An interesting quote which is attributed by some to Sophia Lawrence and by others to Shakespeare it goes as follows, I quote, When I got enough confidence, the stage was gone. When I was sure of losing, I won. When I needed, the people, when I needed people the most, they left me. When I learned to dry my tears, I found a shoulder to cry on. When I mastered the skill of hating, someone started loving me from the core of the heart. And while waiting for light for hours and I, when I fell asleep, the sun came out. That is life. No matter what you plan, you never know what life has planned for you. Success introduces you to the world, but failure introduces the world to you. Often when we lose hope and think this is the end, God smiles from above and says, relax, sweetheart. It is just a bend, not the end. This is what Sophia Lawrence said. Oftentimes, what is seen or perceived as a success today may eventually turn out to be a failure. And what is perceived as a failure today may turn out to be a success tomorrow at a later point of time. I had a real life experience which I would like to share with you. A few years ago, I was presiding over a function organized by the postal department in Madras, Chennai. The chief postmaster general of the Tamil Nadu circle was on the dais with me for releasing a commemorative stamp. <coughs> in the course of our conversation, this chief postmaster general said, Sir, I belong to the 1985 batch of Indian Postal Service, All India Services. Then very casually he said that he knew a particular judge in the Supreme Court. When I asked him how, he said, Sir, the person who is now holding the office of judge of the Supreme Court and me, both of us joined a coaching institute in Delhi for all in cracking the All India Service examination. Both of us cleared the preliminary examination, but in the main written examination, I passed and my friend failed. Therefore, he went back to Chennai to practice law. I succeeded. I could not get into IAS. I got into Indian Postal Service and I am now here. Now, my dear students, on the day on which the main written examination results were declared in 1985. Who was successful? Tell me. Was it this, the person who landed up in the Supreme Court ultimately or was the person who passed the examination at that time and became a Chief Postmaster General? At the time when the results of the examination were declared in 1985, 
the man who later became the chief postmaster general was the successful man and the person who failed in the examination was the unsuccessful person. But after 30 years, the person who succeeded 30 years ago reached the highest office, the only highest office beyond which he could not go, namely chief postmaster general of a particular circle. But the candidate who ran the race along with him 30 years ago and failed became a Supreme Court judge sitting on top of him. What is success? What is failure? I used to tell students whenever I address university students that in a university class you can divide the students into three categories. The first category are those who belong, who, who sit in the first rows, who are very attentive in all classes, who take notes, who promptly do their homework, who go and study at home, who become, who score 100 or 100 marks in all subjects. They became great engineers, doctors, IT professionals, etc. Then the second category of persons are those who sit in the middle rows, who are average students, put in their best efforts, not extraordinarily brilliant. They take BA, MA, social sciences, political administration, economics. Then they write All India Service examinations. They become IAS officers and they become secretaries to government sitting on top of these engineers and doctors. So the second category of persons who are in the middle rows, they sit on top of persons who succeed in life in college from the first row. And what do the third category of people do who sit in the last rows? I don't mean the people sitting here in the last row. They enjoy life. They think college life is for us to enjoy. Let us take life as it comes. And what do they do? They, can't, they could not get into engineering colleges. They can't get into uh, medical colleges. But ultimately it so happens that they are the ones who construct educational co institutions, medical colleges, engineering colleges, and they become, I'm sorry, they become chancellors and pro-chancellors. Dear students, I don't mean to say that all of you persons who are sitting in the front rows should go back to the last row. I am not asking you to do that. But many times, what is successful, who is a successful man and who is an unsuccessful man, cannot be measured by the result that we have today because time alone determines who was successful and who was unsuccessful. That takes us to the third part of our discussion, namely emancipation. Emancipation is defined as the process of being set free from the control of something or someone. It also means to free from restraint, control, or the power of another, or to free from any controlling influence. Till we get educated, we are under the control of many things. We may be under the control of ideas, ideology, preconceived notions, pre-programmed mindset, thought processes, etc. All of us, in one sense or the other, are slaves of many things, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously or unconsciously. 99.999% of people have actually no freedom of thought. As we are all products of the past that we have inherited. Our thoughts are molded by the race to which we belong. The language we speak, the land into which we are born, the environment in which we grow up, the family history, the peer group of which become a, we become a part in school, college, etc. Therefore, ideally, Education should liberate us from these shackles and make us think freely and choose a path that gives happiness. What gives happiness itself is a matter of huge debate. For example, for somebody, a couple of drinks in the evening may give happiness. For a student, a rave party may give happiness. For an artist, 
appreciation and ovation may give happiness and so on and so forth but the real role of education is to make you realize what gives true happiness and not momentary pleasures the distinction between momentary pleasures and true happiness is so vast that you need something more to attain the true happiness i love give you another story because the morals that are taught through stories make very valuable imprints in our young minds there was a great doctor by name howard kelly in the united states he had a very huge hospital a very successful uh, medical person and uh, the hospital owner but howard kelly belonged to a very very poor family which could not afford to send him to school schools in us are little costly therefore he this howard kelly as a school boy as a student he used to sell milk sachets he used to distribute newspapers in the neighborhood earn a few pennies to pay for his education school education one day that howard kelly went without food at home next day morning when he was distributing the milk sachets and newspapers in the neighborhood he was he felt so hungry he wanted to ask from somebody a loaf of bread when he knocked at the door of one house a 13 year old girl came out finding that that girl was of the same age as him he felt ashamed of asking her for some food instead he asked only for a cup of water the girl gave a cup of what cup of milk to this boy howard kelly then this boy asked i asked only for a cup of water that girl said no i see hunger in your eyes therefore i have given you milk though howard kelly did not have any money in order to you know overcome by self pride he said shall i pay you some money for this then that girl little girl smiled and said my dear friend i am not selling milk here i saw hunger in your eyes therefore i thought i must be a good samaritan to give you some food the incident was forgotten howard kelly studied he became big doctor he established a huge hospital 40 years had passed by one day his doctors came to him and said sir we have a patient whose case is very complicated she needs multiple surgeries because of various complications but we do not know her financial status therefore we want to discuss with you howard kelly went through the case sheets and he agreed with them but then he had a hunch he went to the bed where this lady was lying and he asked her madam are you from this particular state she said yes are you from this particular town she said yes from this particular street she said yes then howard kelly asked her how long have you been in that house she said from my birth that's my own house that my parental home i have always lived there howard kelly realized who that girl was he returned he summoned the doctors to give the best of treatments so the doctors gave her the best of treatments after 15 days she, she recouped very well and it was time for her discharge normally in our country patients suffer a second heart attack when it is time for discharge because that is the time when the bill is given to them the first heart attack doctors take care of very well the second heart attack is given by the doctors themselves in the form of bills so what happened was this when this lady was uh, you know uh, perspiring to look at the bill the nurse said madam the doctor handed over a small cover which is only intended for you she wa- he doctor wants to re- wants you to read she opened the cover and howard kelly has written there this bill has been paid in full 40 years ago with one glass of milk therefore what is happiness what do we do what comes back to us are all questions 
which an educational system should make you raise find an answer and emancipate yourself today what we think is we have a list of priorities but these list of priorities are wrongly assembled there was a professor who stood in his philosophy class and he had some items before him when the class began this philosophy professor picked up a, what is called a mayonnaise jar mayonnaise jar is a long you know uh, with a big uh, opening he first picked up some tennis balls and put it in the mayonnaise jar with four ma four tennis balls the mayonnaise it came up to the brink and he asked my dear students is the jar full they said yes then this professor picked up certain pebbles and slowly put those pebbles these pebbles went inside and settled in the space between these balls he asked is the jar now full they said yes he took out coarse sand and put it they all went and settled in the space in between the pebbles he asked is it full the students laughed and said yes sir that was not enough that was not the end of the story he picked up two cups of coffee and poured it it went down and settled then this professor said i want you to recognize that this jar represents your life the tennis balls are very important things they are they represent your family your children your health your friends your favorite passions and if everything else was lost they alone remained your life will still be full with family children health favorite passions etc the pebbles are the other things that matter like your job your house your car etc the sand represents everything certain certain small things in life small pleasures if you put the sand into the jar first there is no room for the pebbles or the tennis balls the same applies to your life the professor said if you spend all your time and energy on the small stuff in life you will never have room for the things that are important to you therefore the professor said you pay attention to those things which are critical in your life to make you happy play with your friends spend time with your parents go for medical checkups keep your body healthy keep your mind healthy that takes care of these represent the golf balls and that the, the tennis balls and that take care of your life then one of the students stood up and said sir you have forgotten this coffee what should we do with this coffee then this professor said i am glad you asked this question once in a once in a one once in a few 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 days once in a week once in a month go out with a friend of yours a good friend of yours for a cup of coffee that will always find a place in your life so how we arrange our priorities what we do with our family what we do with our body what we do with our mind our soul these priorities are something that actually creates emancipation therefore my dear friends education is something that should actually help individuals to develop all good human qualities and it is these human qualities which ultimately make you succeed in life before i conclude i must state that after accepting this invitation of the university to come and speak i had an occasion to browse through your website i found there that this university's mission is encapsulated in three sentences it says to achieve academic excellence through innovatively designed research intensive industry oriented education that is one sentence next is to incorporate community service to install ethical conduct and comp compassion among the stakeholders 
that is the second one. The third one is most important, to give back responsible leaders to society who are capable of enriching the future by bringing positive transformation to the world. I think that education, empowerment, and emancipation, whatever I spoke for about 40 minutes now, has been encapsulated in these three sentences as the vision and mission of your university. Therefore, I am happy to be here with you all for sharing a few thoughts on this topic. Now let me say thank you to you again in Assamese. Thank you.